All right, so um, welcome to Indoor Ag Science Cafe. I'm a um, host in this uh, cafe session. I'm Cherry Kubota uh, from The Ohio State University. So this is a monthly forum, if you are new to this forum, um, uh, talking about indoor farming technologies and science and information, um, creating a community to uh, more freely, you know, exchange information and knowledge. So this um, cafe event is um, uh, basically uh, uh, in two parts. The first one um, is um, information exchange and with the presenter always assigned. And today we have Nicola Kuslake from Contain. Um, she's gonna talk about how to fund your indoor farm. And then after that, mostly we spend for the uh, questions related to the presentation, but um, it doesn't have to be limited for that. So you can bring up something new if you want to bring, use that um, time. Um, so a couple of um, sites we have for uh, uh, putting your questions so that we can, in the near future, we can respond to your questions. One is the query site, um, indoor ag science queries, and then the other one is the um, Q&A forum. So both sites, uh, linkage URL is always available uh, in my uh, email uh, sending out monthly. So um, some of the upcoming cafe series, um, uh, June cafe is gonna be Eric Ranko. Um, he, he's gonna talk about selection or selecting a LED fixture for indoor plant production. This is gonna be a good one. Um, Michigan State University professor, Eric Ranko. And then as usually, um, you know, we, as usual, we don't have July cafe uh, because it's summer. So we are not planning anything on July. But August, we are, are talking to uh, uh, Neil Matson at uh, uh, Cornell University, um, and then maybe his colleagues to talk about um, something out of his um, CEA projects focusing on indoor farming. So the date hasn't been decided, uh, but I will let everyone know um, as soon as the day is um, decided. So with that, I'd like to have Nicola um, for presentation. I think many of you know Nicola um, from um, uh, uh, conference she organized in, um, uh, Oh, I got, um, I got lost. But anyway, you <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but um, you can probably introduce a little bit, Nicola. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, and Cherie, thanks so much for having us today. Um, for those of you I haven't had an opportunity to meet, um, I'm Nicola. I'm the founder of uh, Contain Inc. Um, Contain was the gestation of the project was really the observation that after working with indoor farmers in a different context for a number of years, it became really clear to me that their biggest challenge was not technical or growing or challenging as those challenges those issues are it was really they just couldn't get funding for their farms and that looked like a problem that i could solve for a couple of reasons um, firstly my background is almost entirely in investment management and um, investment banking <coughs> and having lived in uh, three countries um, this just looked like another finance geek problem to solve um, and in addition uh, this is our second rodeo in um, indoor agriculture. As Sheree mentioned, we previously uh, built and sold an event business called Indoor AgCon um, in late 2018. Um, and so that gave us the, um, the impetus to, uh, to get going. Uh, before we talk further, my, uh, our lawyers would like to say hi, um, and they're particularly keen that I let you know that we are not lawyers and that nothing we're gonna talk about today is legal advice. Uh, so Contain is a fintech platform um, for indoor agriculture. Um, we are, the way, what we do is um, we offer lease financing. Um, the way that we work is vendors, so folks who are selling greenhouse equipment, um, really any piece of capital equipment that you would need for your farm, um, HVAC systems, grow systems, um, LED lights, they refer their customers over to us. 
Um, we have an online automated platform that uses algorithms to match them to our growing pool of lenders. Um, and then we take a fee at the point at which the lender puts a lease agreement in place with uh, the farmer. So, um, so that's what that's what we're up to. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to contain.ag, uh, which is our website. Um, so we cover pretty much all of the uh, indoor agriculture um, tech. So warehouse, greenhouse, container structures, and then anything within that that is capital. So anything other than your consumables, seeds and nutrients and so forth, uh, we, we generally cover. Uh, we work with um, half a dozen crops at this point. Um, so produce is obviously the biggest one, uh, but we also see an increasing number of insects, aquaponics, and um, hemp deals uh, in particular. So enough about us. What we're going to talk about today is how you go about funding your indoor farm and some options that you have to do that. This is a um, overall landscape of the various options that we've seen people using. And one thing you'll notice about it is that it's fairly complicated. So we can break the way that a farm is funded down into, <clears throat> into three options. Uh, firstly, you could use equity. Um, so that's essentially you sell a piece of your company to an investor, uh, typically a private investor, but sometimes not. Um, sometimes you'll see the cannabis folks in particular list their, their companies. Um, you could also use debt. So that is would be similar to a mortgage or to a car lease. So you may or may not be making payments every month. Sometimes you make uh, a big balloon payment at the end of your um, at the end of the debt term. Um, and then increasingly, we're also seeing non-dilutive funding available. So this is really any time that you're not expected to pay back the money um, and you're not giving up a piece of your company um, to uh, get that funding. What we see most successful uh, farms and indeed most successful companies do is use a combination of these uh, methods. So um, you generally need to have some sort of equity base in your company to be able to justify to a lender adding debt but at the same time you want some debt because debt is always going to be cheaper than equity an equity investor is going to expect a much higher return out of you um, than a debt investor or than a debt uh, provider um, and non-dilutive funding can be great but it's not without um, hidden costs and it's not always available. Um, so what we see is people really trying to balance between these, uh, these three types. We're going to talk about a specific sort of each of the three of them today, um, but I'm more than happy in Q&A to dig into um, any of the specifics. So we're gonna talk about government funding, which was a relatively small piece of what most indoor farmers did until this virus hit and now we're seeing a dramatic shift in the availability of, of government funding uh, for farms um, then we'll talk about venture capital and private equity it's the area we get asked most about um, we think because um, the largest companies in the industry have used it and then finally we'll talk about uh, debt funding so let's start with um, what's happening on the government funding side. Most people on this call will probably have encountered the Paytech Protection Program, uh, which was instituted through um, the CARES Act a couple of months ago. Um, that is around, as at the end of last week, there was about 146 billion available, um, which sounds like a lot, but um, it's a small fraction of what was there originally. Um, you can apply for 2.5 times your 2019 monthly payroll. Um, and if you use that primarily for um, employee costs over wages, um, that becomes forgivable in um, eight weeks. That process of forgiveness is really quite complicated and the treasury is still working on the rules. Um, so there's this, this, this is very much a moving feast at the moment. Um, what we are hearing anecdotally is that the smaller lenders, particularly online lenders like Square and PayPal, 
um, have uh, availability of these loans right now. The larger banks are largely tapped out. And that's because after the kerfuffle that you may have seen around um, uh, around large companies taking these loans, um, the Treasury changed the rules such that every supplier, every um, intermediary you're working with basically gets the same allocation. So the smaller online guys get, um, uh, you, you have a much better shot with right now. The second program, and this just uh, by way, just incidentally is one of the um, farmers that we worked with, Tim Costley. Um, the second program that's worth mentioning is the USDA's Buy Fresh program, which is um, pledging $100 million per month um, in produce purchases, which will then go to, um, to various food banks and to some other organizations which are able to distribute it to folks who are in need. Is, that, um, is this the same as the fresh uh, fa uh, farmers to fresh? I think Farmer, it's different. Farmers to families? I think it's, I think there's separate programs if I'm understanding it correctly. As I understand it, this is a one-off. This is a six month program, Zale. Oh, okay. Um, though there have been some discussions about it being extended and the folks who do a great job of tracking this are United Fresh. They have some really good information on it. If you uh, look on their website and that, that team's done a really good job of getting the word out on this. The um, application period on this is, is done now um, and they've picked out a number of distributors. Um, the obvious ones within indoor agriculture are Gotham Greens, um, who many of you will know, and uh, Gordon Food Services, um, with whom uh, Square Roots work. Um, but uh, one of the uh, folks I was chatting with suggested that it may be worth getting in touch with some of the distributors who've been selected to see if your farm can, can work with them. Um, and that program began uh, mid-May, so it will run for quite a while. Oops. And then finally, on the uh, on the grant side, the um, in 2018, when they put through the farm bill, there was a lot of excitement because an office of urban agriculture and innovative production was um, established, um, and we are now seeing the first of the grants out of them. Um, so they have announced a solicitation for $3 million in both planning and implementation projects. These can be both for farming and for other subsidiary um, activities like uh, education. Um, there's a webinar next week on June 3rd where we should find out more about the details of how this is going to be administered and what they're looking for. And the grant application for it is on July 6th. So those are three programs that are, are new on the funding side. Um, I will say a number of the farmers that we've worked with um, have managed to get non-dilutive funding from, from some uh, fairly esoteric sources. Uh, the two most common are normally the power companies um, who will often give some sort of rebate on using more efficient equipment or on, um, or on uh, improving energy efficiency within a, a farm. And then also some of the water boards and water companies have been um, pretty good about uh, supporting local uh, farmers, so they're always worth checking out as well. So onto the area that we get asked about the most, um, uh, onto venture capital funding, um, uh, just over 70% of the funding for the top 10 companies uh, comes from venture capital and angels and angel investors. So what we did in uh, this diagram is we took um, the top 10, the largest fundraisers in the in the country, and we broke it down and said, okay, where where did their funding actually come from? And what you'll see is that the vast majority of it is from those two categories. So just for folks who aren't familiar with this, venture capital is typically an established company, an established fund. Um, that is investing on behalf of its clients or on behalf of an institutional clients. They typically have two to three years to invest and then uh, three to four years to dispose of the assets. And the folks that you'll hear about here are the likes of Sequoia and um, uh, NEA and uh, Osprey, which we'll talk about later. Angel investors are typically private um, investors are normally investing on their own behalf with their own money, though increasingly we do see um, groups of angels banding together uh, to form 
um, groups that have greater access and greater ability to, to make deals. So a lot of folks chase venture capital funding and we have seen an enormous increase in interest um, in indoor agriculture investments. So back in 2016, there was about 100 million invested in indoor ag investment. Now this is just in the US. Um, that number has jumped. And in both 2017 and 2019, we saw just under 400 million um, invested in, in the US uh, alone. Now, most of this, about three quarters, of, sorry, about two thirds of it has gone to uh, the big um, ver vertical farm companies such as um, 80 Acres, Aero Farms, Bowery, Bright Farms, uh, Gotham, and uh, Plenty. Um, what's been interesting in the past couple of months is we have seen a slowdown in venture capital in general. And in particular, what has happened is that companies have said, venture capital funds have said, we're just going to support our existing portfolio companies. So essentially, if we already invested in you, we're going to keep investing in you. Because the last thing you want to do as a VC is um, have to write off your, your portfolio companies prematurely because they can't get access to capital. But the interest in indoor agriculture has actually risen and we have seen a number of decent size uh, rounds close um, just in the past couple of months. So um, Beta Hatch is an example out of, um, uh, out of Seattle who just uh, raised a decent size round and Cubic Farms who we'll hear from shortly um, have also uh, raised within the past few months. Now you could see this as one of two things, either venture capitalists are saying agriculture looks like a much better bet than it did a couple of months ago, or it's a testament to um, the strength of some of the companies that we're now seeing coming through. Um, so three, four years ago, it was fine and it worked pretty well to go into a venture capitalist with a, a pitch deck that was, I'm going to grow leafy greens at a better price than anyone else. Um, those companies have now moved on. They're now raising 100 million, 200 million type rounds. Um, and what we're seeing coming through at the smaller end at anything from a million up to, to 10 million um, type sizes is folks who are focusing on um, automation, robotics, and energy cost reduction in um, indoor farms plus folks who are able to um, offer up unique crops, so something other than uh, traditional uh, leafy greens. And then the factor that's not captured in this chart is that we are seeing a replication of this in Europe. Um, in particular, there have been a number of very interesting companies springing up, um, folks like Intelligent Growth Solutions who are um, promising energy cost reductions in, um, in indoor farms. So, most of the folks we, oops, sorry. Uh, oh, what happened to this slide? Uh, uh, apologies. Um, the, uh, most of the folks that we talk with uh, view venture capital as an unalloyed positive. And in particular, they uh, are excited by the fact that it offers essentially instant funding. Um, if you do want to appear in uh, Bloomberg or the Wall Street Journal, Getting yourself a brand name venture capitalist is a really easy and simple way of doing that. Um, and in addition, it does bring you some clout. If you want to hire from large tech companies or you want to um, add um, to, to your team from prestigious sources, um, having a good VC on board can definitely help you with that. Um, however, there are only about 2% of companies will ever have venture capital. And many of your many companies are perfectly profitable and arguably uh, more successful without it. Um, and so we always encourage people to balance the, uh, the positives and the excitement of, of going out and chasing venture capital with, um, with some of the negatives. So in particular, uh, re your return expectations out of venture capitalists are going to be pretty high, uh, typically 30% plus. Um, that other voice at the table, particularly if they're a board member, can be good, but it can also be rough. Um, sometimes uh, folks just don't get along and you are going to be working with this person for seven or eight years. Um, it's, uh, it's marriage, it's not dating. And most importantly to, to my mind is 
um, is the time that it takes to raise venture capital. So typically it takes anywhere between three and nine months, depending on uh, what you're looking at. Um, but notoriously during a downturn, that uh, period extends. So it can be a year plus during a downturn. In addition, uh, venture capital notoriously accrues to certain demographics. So um, the folks who don't typically do as well with venture capital and don't typically have um, great access to it are women and um, entrepreneurs of color. And so what, we, what the data shows is that those two demographics uh, spend longer raising less. And it may be that it still, it still makes sense to go do that. And in fact, in indoor agriculture, we have seen um, two uh, women entrepreneurs raise significant rounds in, just in the past year. So um, Alison Artemis raised it 8 million in the middle of 2019. And I mentioned Virginia at Beta Hat just raised a, a strong round as well. Uh, so the, the hope is that those um, biases are changing, but um, it's certainly something that folks should, should bear in mind before they decide that this is, is the way to go. But you don't have to take my word for it because we're fortunate to have Dave Dennison with us today uh, from Cubic Farms. Hey, Dave, how are you doing? Doing great. Uh, good morning, Nicola. Nice to see you. Uh, you too. So um, Dave and his team just raised a $3 million round led by Osprey, which is one of the better known investors in the space. And he very kindly agreed to jo join us this morning to give you a little uh, real life entrepreneur um, fundraising uh, insight. Um, so Dave, let's, um, could you tell us a little about uh, you and about Cubic Farms and how you uh, got to this point? Sure. So uh, Cubic Farms is an ag tech company. Um, we've, we're focused on automated uh, controlled environment technologies. We have, we have two patented technologies. One is on the, uh, what I call the terrestrial growing side. So uh, vegetables, leafy greens, but we also do germination, propagation, cloning, um, all sorts of things. And, and then we also have a, uh, an animal feed division where we have a, a fully automated uh, system to um, plant, grow, harvest, clean, replant, completely automated to grow commercial scale quantities of animal feed. So we have, we have both sides of, of that business. Um, so our, our, our goal is, is to help our farmer customers be successful. So ver vertical farmers, um, greenhouse, nursery, uh, field farmers, they're all potentially our, our customers, as well as uh, some groups that are just coming into the space. And then, of course, dairy farmers, beef cattle, racehorses, um, all, all sorts of different sort of livestock uh, farmers as, as well are, are our customers. So we, we were founded by a, a Dutch greenhouse group called Bevo Farms. Um, they're a 33-year-old propagation greenhouse organization. Uh, they're headquartered in Langley, British Columbia, Canada. And um, they started working on the technology on the, on the vegetable side, if you will, um, about, uh, about 10 years ago. And I got involved about four and a half years ago when they determined the technology was ready to, to begin to take to market. And uh, as you know, um, a machine that grows great produce is, is maybe 10% of the business. The other 90%, of course, is things like financing that we're talking about this morning. But it's also engineering, manufacturing, logistics, sales, marketing, legal, installation, training after installation support, all of those sorts of things. So um, that, that was the team that I came in to you know, raise capital, put the business together, take it global and turn it into a global ag tech business that supplies this, this kind of stuff to farmers. And so you just raised from, uh, from Osprey. Tell us about that experience. How was that? Yeah. So um, it, it was interesting raising during a pandemic. Um, I hadn't, uh, one of my colleagues had met uh, someone from Osprey in the past and, and had been to their office. Um, but I had never met them personally and still haven't. Um, so everything that we've done has been on Zoom like we're using today um, and uh, doing virtual tours. So some FaceTime virtual tours and, and, and things like that. So it, it was a very interesting experience um, and it was about um, 
uh, it was probably about two months from you know first initial discussion to closing. So it was actually one of the fastest rounds uh, I've ever uh, been through, having done lots of different capital raises over my career. Um, and so I'm not sure if the pandemic uh, was the reason it went so fast, but when you don't have to, you know, have plane tickets and uh, all these sort, of, it's it's actually incredibly efficient. Um, uh, raising uh, during this time uh, if, if you've got something unique and interesting um, that, that people want. And so Dave, why do you think that you were able to raise when, I mean, there's probably what 40, 50 companies out uh, raising in this space right now. What do you think you guys brought that um, was exciting to Osprey? Yeah, I, probably for us is that we are focused on on the technology side. So uh, we're in the automated controlled environment ag space uh, focused on uh, automation. And I, I, I think there, there's a couple of things. So one, we have a couple of, of, of globally patented or an established team, um, you know, great engineers, project managers, great growers. And then we also already had sales um, on both the, the feed and the fresh sides of our business. And, and I think the fact that, that you, know, you, you bring all of that together and, and we were raising growth capital. Um, and with a lot of additional interesting things in, in our pipeline, both from you know, the customer perspective, large deals that we've recently announced, and then uh, new advances in our, in our technology. I think when you add all that together, uh, Osprey looked at it and, uh, and thought, yeah, we, we, we want a piece of this. But you're, you're being modest also. This isn't your first rodeo, right? You've, you've raised and managed uh, pretty big startups before and, and scaled them. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, I did. Um, it, it wasn't in the ag space, however. Um, so luckily I've got great growers and engineers and manufacturing partners because I'm, I'm not the, the best at, at all of those things. I'm learning. <laughs> um, but uh, on, on my side, it is putting the team together uh, and then, you know, leaving the company. We also went public um, almost a year ago. We were a spin out of Bevo Farms. Um, we were probably earlier than we should have been to, to, to be public. Um, but uh, once enough water goes under the bridge, you can actually turn it into a positive thing. And it did let us do our acquisition, which, which I'm very grateful for. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd run a, a, a large uh, company and, and we had exited, uh, ended up selling it twice actually. And how much do you think the, the fact that you weren't just doing traditional leafy greens and that you weren't a uh, traditional farm helped? I mean, you have this animal fodder system, which is really kind of neat. I've actually crawled inside one. It's pretty cool. Um, how much do you think that helped that it was something that was different that they probably hadn't heard before? Yeah, um, quite, uh, actually. Um, the, 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 the company we acquired was called Hydro Green. Uh, it's still called Hydro Green. Um, and um, it's, it is the most automated system uh, on, on the planet for growing commercial scale um, animal fodder. And so um, th they saw that as being very, very novel and, and unique. Um, but same on, on, on the cubic farm side um, for growing leafy greens and, and all sorts of other terrestrial plants. Um, they saw that as being unique. Um, and because it is you know, fairly automated, um, it's it's a unique offering and they like the fact that we're on the tech side yeah and so final question for you so um there there are doubtless folks on the call today who are looking to raise vc uh what recommendations would you give them yeah so um getting the right people uh into your into your cap table is is very very helpful um it, it begins to open other doors it, 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 as nicola alluded to earlier so it, it is worth the chase uh, but you, you do need definitely need to be prepared um for um you you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you're going to find a prince and so um I, I think being patient being calm um people can smell desperation and uh and so i think having your story buttoned down um, don't go in and do a pitch uh, unless you've rehearsed it a whole bunch of times, you know, maybe to a couple friendly people. Have it be concise and, and, and just really, really buttoned down. And if, if you're selling, why is someone buying? And I think that's one of the number one questions you have to be able to answer. 
If your company is so great, why do you want to give up a piece of it? And yes, it, it's easy to actually to answer that question, but have a good answer for it. And um, it, I, I've found raising capital is actually a lot of fun. I enjoy sales. I, I enjoy it. And I, I think people feel that enthusiasm, that joy, that passion, that vision. They have to feel that you are just so in, in love with what you're doing, but very professional and not blind to you know, your weak spots. Talk about your team. Talk about why you're better. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for joining us, Dave, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, stick around for Q&A in a couple of minutes. Sure. Happy to. Thank you. So with that, we're going to move on. If I can get my screen to share, we're going to move on with uh, to uh, the final type of uh, funding, which is uh, credit. Um, so in essence, this is where you are um, taking out a loan and paying it back. And um, when it comes to um, to business, they, some of these can be quite interesting structures. We are at a really interesting time for credit for indoor agriculture. Uh, when we founded uh, Contain, there really wasn't that much availability of credit for um, farmers. And what we have discovered over the past couple of years is that there is a softening in the approach. So when um, I first started this, I spent six months cold calling to find a lender who would work with us, which ended up being a small lease shop out of the West Coast. And now we get calls pretty much every week, um, some of them from a larger brand name uh, banks who are really interested in the space. Now, what uh, traditional, and apologies, I'm going to geek out a, a little here, what um, traditional economics tells us about what should happen now is that we see a sharp rise in defaults, which we're beginning to see in, in certain other areas of the economy, that we see um, rising interest rates, and that we see dramatically reduced um, credit availability. We have not seen that for indoor agriculture yet, and it's not clear if that's because um, people are still waiting to figure out what's gonna happen um, after we come out of these various lockdowns, or if indoor agriculture is going to be the um, alternate energy of this cycle. So what happened with um, alternate energy during the last downturn is actually they managed to get a large number of projects built and they managed to get um, a significant amount of funding because lenders saw them as a better bet than a number of the um, alternate um, industries that had been um, hurt by the downturn. And there's some evidence just from the lenders that we're speaking with that that will be the case for um, indoor agriculture. So aside from one lender who is very exposed to the restaurant space, we have not seen any slow up and in fact, we have seen a pickup in inquiries uh, from lenders who are interested in uh, interested in working with us. The reason I'm still a little cautious on uh, this situation is that this is one of the weirdest periods I think that anyone who's worked in financial markets has ever seen. And you really have three conflicting effects going on. So the first is what I'll loosely call the PPP loan effect. So um, until a couple of months ago, if you wanted to get let a loan for your uh, small business, you had a variety of options, SBA loans, uh, banks, and so forth. Everything changed the day that the PPP loans went into effect because any sane business person is going to go after those first before anything else. And so what we've seen is the number of lenders pull back from the market because they just want to focus on getting these uh, PPP loans out. They do actually get paid quite well for, for doing so. And so one that's fairly notable is Cabbage, which is a um, lender to small businesses. It's an online lender that's backed by SoftBank. And they announced in the second week of April that they would be only doing PPP loans for the minute. Now that could mean that they're not going to come back to doing traditional loans, but it could also mean that we're just going to have this strange interregnum whilst that, um, whilst that particular program works itself out. As I mentioned, we're seeing much more interest in agriculture in general and in indoor ag in particular. Um, from a lender's perspective, it's gone from being something that was really quite esoteric 
um, and they weren't quite sure how it fit into their portfolio to something that they're now seeing as a way that um, the world recovers um, from this virus. And we're seeing a great deal more interest in, um, in it as a consequence. One of our lenders actually uh, sent us an email saying all of a sudden ag looks a lot less risky. And then the other factor is that the Fed has uh, cut interest rates and there is still plenty of loan capacity out there in the marketplace. This is a very different situation to 2008. Um, and I'm more than happy to um, talk in more detail about that, but I'm aware it's fairly um, uh, esoteric and geeky. So I'll just leave it at that. There is plenty of, of capacity out there. What uh, I think is worth uh, thinking through is that lenders have a very different focus to equity or VC investors. And we often see folks coming to us who are essentially trying to take an equity approach to working with a lender. So they come in with the big vision and the uh, pitch deck and the enthusiasm that, that Dave was mentioning. And for lenders, that's really not as alluring. Lenders typically have essentially a black box model that they, um, that they work with. And you are not going to charm the black box model. You have to, to focus on making sure that you can increase your odds within um, their existing parameters. And there are really six things they care about. Um, collateral is probably the biggest one. Um, if you are a startup farm, the odds are that a lender will be looking for um, not just the equipment as collateral, but something else, or it would definitely help your odds. And so uh, buildings, uh, land, um, cross holdings with an existing entity all really help. Um, about 80% of the folks we work with are startups, but if you are a farm with a track record, that really helps. And the magical point is at two years uh, when <clears throat> your farm becomes a lot more fundable. Uh, lease sizes, we often see requests from startups that are um, just outsized compared to what lenders are willing to do. Um, and in particular, we encourage folks to, uh, to start small. Um, Increasingly, customer agreements are becoming available to indoor farms, which is, again, a real change from what we even saw six months ago. But we're now seeing supermarket and some institutional customers being willing to write um, LOIs or other customer agreements. That is something that lenders really love to see, particularly if it's from large, secure brand names. Um, we only work with folks who are able to put down a 20% deposit. Through trial and error, what we've learned is that if you don't have that large of a deposit to put down, you're probably not going to make it through your, um, your startup period, which as pretty much anyone on the call who has started a farm will tell you can be uh, long and hard to get your initial crops out of the uh, greenhouse or vertical farm. And so you really need to have enough cash on hand to be able to support yourself, which is where having an equity investor or having some sort of um, equity base really helps. And then last but least is the thing that, that folks always think is the most important, which is credit rating. Um, as long as you have a decent credit rating, most lenders tend to be less concerned about that nowadays. Um, and it's not the be all and end all. These are not, this is not like getting a car loan or a mortgage. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how do you increase your odds, particularly if you're a startup of, of getting uh, lease financing? Um, the biggest factor is really starting small. So the folks who don't do so well are folks who come in and are looking for over a million dollars up front. Um, most lenders want to see that you have some sort of track record of growing a crop. And so you're much better off starting up a small farm and proving out your concept even with one small customer and then scaling it from there and selling out that customer having that customer love you and come back to you and and want to expand with you that's a much much better route to go than trying to do a much larger farm from the get-go the biggest mistake we see is uh, we get incredibly complicated uh, plans that we spend a fair amount of time trying to understand but if you're um, project involves um, anything other than putting your farm up and operating your farm as cleanly as possible. It is a deterrent to lenders. So the classic things we see are folks trying to do very complicated tax deals around their farms uh, when they're startups. 
Um, we also see folks who are trying to do $5 million plus farms having no prior experience, and that's not something that lenders will typically entertain. Um, and we see um, folks who are trying to um, use novel equipment. Um, it's hard enough farming as it is. There are plenty of amazing vendors out there. Um, and they are able to uh, reassure uh, lenders that they are able to support this equipment and that they have a track record of successful commercial production. So if what, <coughs> if what you really want to do is farm, uh, then farm and keep everything else simple. Um, and then the final one is be realistic. This is not, no one is going to give you $5 million if you, all you've invested is a couple of thousand dollars into your farm. Typically, you want to look at less than one time your net assets as an ask um, of lenders. And um, most lenders are not going to, um, to go over that. Um, so that, uh, I realize, Shuri, that we're over time and I apologize for that. Um, so just in summary, um, funding in the time of coronavirus is, is an interesting and moving feast. I think we're going to learn over the next couple of months that, um, uh, that there, we're going to see longer VC funding cycles. We're going to see greater reliance on government funding, and we're going to see lenders being available but more picky um, as to what they will fund. Um, and as Dave said, uh, what you want to focus on in VC is your traction and your tech. And what you want to focus on in debt is scaling down your project, keeping it realistic and making it as simple as possible. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sherry. And thanks again for having us today.